Let's see if I can do this in a one taker. One take wonder. No edit. Just an intro. Just a normal cool intro. Couple of plugs. Tell you what's going on. Tell you who the guest is. It's going to be great. Starting from now. Hello everyone. I am staying true to my word. Which is to give you content. Constant content. Constant. I call it. Um, I'm going to give you an episode, two episodes a month. That is my, that's what I'm doing. That's what's been happening. I've been having errors with equipment, which I have used a credit card to fix those errors. Also with the help of people, the lovely people at Road. Not a plug, but they did help me out with a couple of issues I was having. And now we can continue with the new Video, mostly video episodes. You might be watching this early on the Patreon. It's only one pound. What do you mean it's only one pound? It's only one pound. And what does that do? Well, that allows me to buy cameras and shit so we can do this. Well, what else do I get for a pound? Well, you might be watching the video version of this early. Or you might be awaiting the new Downbeat products. The cool vintage t-shirts that feel like they're they're like 100 years old, 30 years old, um, and look like a cool band, but actually it's a podcast, so when someone goes, it's not even a podcast, but it is a brand, isn't it? Certainly not a drum podcast. Someone goes, well, that's a cool t-shirt, name three songs. Well, I'll name three episodes. How about that, motherfucker? They're all, yeah, so, you know, if you're not on the Patreon, you can just go to www.thedownbe.at, so it spells downbeat, and just pick one up there. Anyway, there's new stuff, there's shorts, there's basketball jerseys, hopefully, t-shirts, hoodies, coffee cups, sort of like Supreme, but marginally less Supreme. My guest, going well, isn't it? My guest this week is Pat Sheridan from Fit for an Autopsy. Making Fit for an, for an Autopsy the only band other than Architects to have more than two members. We've had Hosian, we've had Will, now we've got Pat. Pat made a brief appearance at the end of Tom Williams from Straight from the Past episode. They were playing in Glasgow, I had to get him back in. It, yeah, he's got, he's got a past, we delve into that, trigger warning. There's some horrible shit in his childhood. We talk about that. It was it was fun, but it was very serious. That bit wasn't fun. It was very serious. He owns a tattoo shop, right? Other than being the guitarist and fit for an autopsy, he owns a tattoo shop, which was a little bit crippled from COVID. He, you know, we talked about what it's like working. I nearly messed up there, nearly an edit. What it's like working with Will Putney, which is something I talk about all the time. Um, having to play Will Putney's riffs which Will Putney doesn't have to play, really. He just sits down and plays them, and then Pat has to be the person to play them whilst rocking TF out. Um, Yeah, that was about it. It's in person. You might be watching it on YouTube or on the Patreon. I did a multicam edit. If you're on the Patreon, sorry to keep plugging it. It pays now for me to do stuff like sit and learn how to do multicams. That's only going to get better. Uh, Let me know what you think. Pat Sheridan on the Downbeat podcast. I'm gonna t- that's how I start. There are four different backups running. Four. Because I've fucked this before. <laughs> so we've got one in the camera, one on the computer, one on each of our microphones, and one on that Rode Caster Pro thing there. Sometimes you're gonna make sure all bases are covered. Because I, the last time I did this, I did it with Aaron Gillespie. It was a huge huge episode for me and then and i <laughs> fucked it i i was like ah, oh, you know what? i won't do the backups it's gonna be fine and i completely destroyed it yep well fine. i mean live and learn brother pat so, yeah what the fuck are you doing in glasgow um uh, making music <laughs> finally for the first time in like three years is this so, the first this is the second tour first european tour since uh covid what was the Last one was the uh, The Artist Murder Carnifex tour that we did um, in the Europe, UK. Did you have to go home on that tour? No, was it real the, close? Next, the next tour. We were direct support to The Art in the States. So we were in uh, Europe January, February, I believe 2019 
I want to say it was. Maybe. 2020? 2020. Yeah, it would have been 2020. 2020. We, we did a... Yeah, 2019. 2020. I'm confusing dates. So it was 2020. We all got... I'm allowed to say uh, whatever, right? You can right? say fucking... Uh, we you can were, say cunt on this one. Oh, I like You can that. say whatever you want. Fucking sick. Like, me and Marshy disappeared. And then I got sick, like, two days later... And then at night, I was sitting outside Marsh from the Arts Bunk, who's a close personal friend, listening to him breathe. And he would stop breathing for like 30 seconds and had <gasps> in his sleep. He was so congested and like, but we didn't know anything about COVID at all yeah. at that time. They were like, oh, go ahead, get on a plane and go to the place where this thing is happening. Yeah. Don't worry about that. You'll be fine. You know, nobody said anything to us. So... We all got sick, but we just thought it was, you know, your typical tour sick. Like, everybody gets sick on tour, every tour. Yeah. And then we get home, feeling fine, spry, and ready to go on another tour. Nice. And then first day of that next direct support to Thy Art, um, first day, last day. So. Wait, so that was in America, though? In America. So you, you, wow, they had to fly home. Oh, let me tell you how fucked it was. Think about this. <laughs> They're from Australia. So they had to fly home, and then that Un Missouri band is from Iceland, and they had to fly home, and then all the bands on the package already. So it was crazy, like crazy. That's so much money lost. Okay, to put it into perspective, I can't talk about other people's profit and loss stuff, but what I can say for Fit is we had a merch person, excuse me, a sound guy, all the guys from the band. Yep. A van and trailer that were rented, about fifteen, seventeen thousand American dollars worth of merch in the trailer. A board that we rented, a snake that we rented. Like I can go through everything, but we were easily thirty-five thousand dollars in debt that day. And that's with not international flights and visas. And these guys had to have another fucking twenty grand on top of that, right? So here's what I will say. Fit for an autopsy. I hate the word fans, right? It's like my least favorite word. Because I don't... If, if, saying, oh, we have fans, it sounds like so cocksuckerish. What, what do you call them then? Friends of the band. Friends of the band that support us, right? Nice. Because I think it's gross to be like, I Yeah, I, I feel gross saying the yeah, word. Yeah, it feels I, I, weird. I feel like I don't say it. Because, you know, coming from the world that I come from, like punk and hardcore, like fans just sounds... Blech. Yeah. You know? So the people who support us, all of the people that come out to our shows, we put our merch up. The next day, it was online. And I swear to God, in less than 48 hours, we sold every single piece of merch we had. Yeah. I couldn't fucking believe how much support we got. So to everybody who bought a shirt or told their friends that we got fucked and their friend bought a shirt or whatever, like, you guys saved our band. Like, legit saved Fit for an Autopsy from crashing and burning. So... I, wow. I feel like the pandemic, like, was eye-opening for friends. Friends of the band. Friends of the us. bands <laughs> that, like, they some of them realized, like, oh, like this is this is. Like, I knew that streaming services weren't paying well enough or whatever, mm -hmm. but this is like my favorite bands are going to split up. Yeah, which I mean, is true. I believe that if fans of music were not as supportive as they are we all would have lost our asses. It would have been over. I mean, think about, we canceled like seven or eight tours. And you know how much money a band makes on a tour, like a band that's doing fairly well. It's the only thing you can fucking do. Yeah, and Not like- money from CDs. Yeah, and you know, vinyl and shows are really the only thing, we, and t-shirts, that's it. You don't make money off of making records. Like, let's talk about the misconception of being on a label. I love your fucking soapbox immediately. I yeah. love it. Go. But I don't give a fuck. There's a big misconception about what happens with bands when they get signed. Yeah. They're like, oh, well, these bands are getting these big number things and blah, blah. It's like, well, it's a loan. It's not my money. Yeah. I don't see that money. We use that to record and make a record and press a record and get the art. And if you see four videos from a band, it's because they had a budget to do four videos. Yeah. Somebody just doesn't come in and go, I love your band. I'm going to record yeah, a video. It's like, that'll be $11,000 yeah. American. And you, you know? borrow the money from the label to make those videos. Yep. And then you pay that money back through what percentage is left over from a record sale. What percentage is yours 
depending on your deal, that's the money that you pay back the other stuff from. Right. So no one makes any money. Right. And no one makes any money. And and the craziest part is, is like another great thing about COVID is... Another right? great thing about COVID. You don't hear that much. No, this is, there were some really big positives. Great thing about COVID is that people stopped, took a breath, dealt with their mental sides of things that they have to deal with. And I'm sure some people are still dealing with it. But then they locked into music, they locked into movies, they locked into entertainment, they locked into being able to read things and learn things like education and different stuff. I know a lot of people started businesses, found new ways to make money, you know, don't have to depend on big corporations anymore to make a living. I mean, we were just talking about that five minutes mm-hmm. ago. Like there are some pretty positive things that came out of such a terribly negative thing like COVID. And all of our records right up until this one that we just recorded recouped during COVID. So like, that's when you start to actually make a little profit. I mean, you have to think we released our first record, like, I don't fucking know, like 2011 or 12 or th- something like that, like eons ago, never recouped. And then all of a sudden, like that, all of our records, people are listening. Yeah, and I think we recouped during the pandemic it's, as well. It's crazy. We got, I got a check from Samaria and I was like, what the fuck is this? No one right? gets those. Yeah. <laughs> so like, take a minute to think about that. Like all of these folks that were home, all these humans that were trying to travel through their brain during all the chaos, there were some things that happened to some of us because those people locked into these things and those things helped them. And by those things helping them, it helped us. And now we can start from literal scratch and come back and do this thing that we do again. Like there's a couple of things that happen that, you know, I, you know, I'm not an overly positive kind of person, no. but I'm also you have your moments. Yeah. But I'm, I'm logical. And when I sat down and I thought about everything, I was like, holy shit, you know, as bad as this was, like I can have a career when this is over. And now that we're getting back on our feet and playing shows and people are coming out, it feels like home again. But like, if it wasn't for everybody watching who support, not even us supported just whatever band they supported, mm-hmm. we would all been fucked. We would have been, you know, folding t-shirts in some fucking store or I, serving I mean, at a restaurant. I mean, the stores or, were fucking closed as well. Who knows what we would have fucking done. I, yeah. they, I, two things you touched on there that I want to talk about. So number, number one, these t- shows back and don't play it up if it's not true. Were they... So like, well, you did one US tour and then this one since everything came back. Yeah, we're about so, four, I think it's day four. Was it as romantic as may, as you thought it was in like, you know, during the pandemic, I'll give you my, my experience quickly and mm-hmm. then you can bounce off that. During the pandemic, I was like, I cannot wait to play a show, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be amazing. The energy is going to be amazing. Then we did five shows in the US. I got COVID on those shows. They weren't that great. Uh... And I was like, oh, that was like the most anticlimactic thing ever. But then we did that Under Oath tour and I was like, okay, this is right. the romance. I think, it, I think it depends on the situation, right? And it depends on what your outlook is. Um, I've been playing shows since the early 90s. I mean, I'm 46 years old. And having, that's the longest amount of time since I can, since I was a fucking baby. My brother's been taking me to shows since 1986, heavy. I was not alive. Right. I was 10 going on 11, 86 to 87. I went to my first show on my- What was the first show? My first show was a bunch of thrash metal bands, Cyanide, Silo, Abaraxis, like all these like local thrash metal bands. And then I went to that with my brother. And then like a couple of weeks later- I Where saw, was local? Let's get a little uh, local, pat, pat Edison, backstory. New Jersey. Um, I grew up between Edison and New Brunswick. So and yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with New Brunswick. Um, but, um, so there was like a, uh, like a rec center, you know, like a sports rec center and they used to do shows there. So I saw this local thrash metal show and then a couple of days later we went to see Exodus and DRI. So like my upbringing was like instantly hooked, you know what I mean? And like, then I was going to shows like every weekend. And then by the time I was like 13 or 14, I had made friends in the local hardcore scene and I was jumping the train into New York and going to CBGB's at 14 like Brennan from SFA used to work the front door and like we used to go in there all the time and like all this shit. It's just crazy how like everything developed from me going to shows, my whole life changed. So that was the longest stint that I had 
of not going to shows. In like 30 fucking 30, seven years or yeah. whatever. I mean, imagine that. So I was going crazy, you know, and I, I, I was trying to be positive and doing all these workouts and putting them on the internet. And it was only a matter of time before I crashed. And, mm, right. you know, everybody was trying to be so positive and then it just took me over. And um, so when we came back, the first few shows were sold out and fucking crazy. And it was our headliner. You had the... So I had the romance yeah. immediately, you know. It was instant vibration. Like, I, I got on stage. Uh, the first show was like kind of a clusterfuck in Ohio, but it was great. And then we played in Chicago the next day, I think. And um, what's the venue in Chicago with the sewer in the stage? It's like a big cement stage with a sewer in it. I can't, a sewer? I can't remember. It's like a, like a manhole cover, but I can't remember the name. I always forget. It's a really great venue. The staff is sick. But anyway, I'm sure people who know it will remember the name of the club. But, bottom uh, Lounge. Mm-mm. We only ever play the Bottom Lounge and that one that's almost downtown that is... It's the one with the train tracks that run over top of oh, it. Oh, fuck. No, that's the one. Yeah. And there's, there's like the, you have to go upstairs. Or maybe you play the big room. I don't know. No, we play the big room. You must have played the big room. You played the big room too, probably. I think there's only one room. It's got that really good bar restaurant next door. There's like a park across the street. And no, when you're on stage, it's a big venue. cement stage. And it's got like a Ninja Turtles like sewer top nah, to it. it's not the same venue. I can't remember. I fucking, I feel bad because the venue's incredible. But the show was crazy. And then the next day was crazy. And then we played in uh, Iowa City at this weird bar, barbecue slash show venue kind of place. And... 400 kids showed up on a Tuesday night. Nice. In Iowa City. And I was like, this is it. And 17 sold out shows or so. 16, 17 sold out shows. So it was romantic. It was beautiful. That's fucking awesome. It was like the what best. What was the lineup? Uh, it was Fit, Enterprise Earth, Ingested. Uh, Wait, that's the same as this It's tour. the same tour, but um, what was the... But Sentinels is on this tour. Great American Ghost is on this tour. And they were on the last one. But there's another band on the last one, and I'm drawing a blank again because I'm bad at this. But uh, we have one band swap. So it was very close to this tour that we're doing right now. And nice. uh, it's, it's been good. How good know? are Ingested? Ingested are great. Fucking so sick. Yeah, like love, laughably fast yeah, as well. It's like all the best parts of a bunch of bands that I like filled with like British humor. Yeah, I used you to know? work I, in like 2008. I used to work in a warehouse with Lynn. Yeah, drummer. Lynn's Actually, sick Lynn's dude. Way. He's a fucking amazing, sick, amazing sick drummer. Human. Yeah, great drummer. So fast. Nice dude. He used to. I don't know if he still does his. I think he's chilled out. Top, no, but he used to do stuff like. It's not my place to say, but I'm going to say it. He used to do stuff like boof two pills up his ass, stick a fucking bottle of wine up there, <laughs> flip <laughs> flip onto his back, butt chug the bottle of wine with two fucking ecstasy tablets up his ass. And then we'd just be fucked up. And then he would have the most crazy night, because we, I used to tour when he was in annotations with him, and he would have the most crazy fucking night, and then he would just play like a maniac the next day. It didn't matter. Absolute shredder. I though. mean, I can barely wake up in the morning, and I'm straight edge. I don't do anything. So, yeah, I mean, those guys are incredible. They're incredible. And they're, you know, they, they played, we played in Manchester, and that's their hometown. And it was great. It was great to watch them receive that kind of like hometown warm welcome, aka break the guy next to you's arm. Yeah, a you know warm I mean? fucking yeah, warm ass beating, <laughs> a warm fucking <laughs> slam welcome. But it was good, man. They were really good. I, I I enjoy those guys as people too. You know that Sentinels band. They're opening the tour, and they're kind of a young band, but they're really doing it, and they're very nice kids. You know, I know Dave, the drummer, on there. Yeah, he's a great drummer. Dave's nice dude, great fucking haircut, good kid. He's got the he's fucking got, he's got a, the me haircut. He's got going a on. great haircut. He's got the me haircut. Yeah, going yeah. On. I've seen so it. He's uh, the band is good, and Great American Ghost is a band that I think everybody needs to know about. The band's fucking. They're like awesome. a secret weapon, man. Yeah. Um, every record they put out, it's kind of like what we do, where they're kind of like formulating changes for every record and like naturally becoming a better band, but like also finding different ways to change their sound but still be who they are yeah and i fucking love watching bands take that evolution you know you have bands like 
hate breed who can make the same record a million times and it's just awesome. But then I go Jira is another record that or another band rather that people like compare us to. But I think one thing that we really have in common is like it's a constant change. It's a constant yeah. change all the time. And I think Great American Ghost is another one of those bands that have found a way to explore different sounds but not lose their identity. And that's a all really all excellent gym bands as well. Yes. Great American Ghost Fit. The new fit is on the gym rotation. Yeah, buddy. The fuck, what is the fucking song? The song with the fuck... I was talking to Will on the podcast about it. I'm terrible with song names. Uh, with the weird riff. It's weird. That. Yeah, higher level hate. Song fucking rip. That's not my gym jam off the record. But they're, really? But my gym jam off the record is uh, In Shadows. It's just insane, insane fucking Jim Bang. I mean, there. Will's a fucking genius, dude. I mean, he bottom is. line, like everybody's like, oh, Will writes all your music. And I'm like, there's always a guy in every, in band. every band. Like, you're just fucking me off. Don't take a piss. Espe- especially in fucking like death metal, death core, yeah. like, like any like super metal. What you happens? need that. It's precise. Yeah, what happens if you have too many cooks in the kitchen? Everything comes out like shit. So Will just doesn't tour with us. And they're like, oh, he tours with N. And I'm like, yeah, they do a couple of weeks here or there. But he, fits a touring machine. Yeah. He needs to be home doing he his job. He does end for a vacation. Yeah. He, he and, wants the cosplay. Like <laughs> right, right now, Will Putney, I saw some clip last night. And they're like sleeping in fucking like hostels that we used to sleep in like fucking 10 years ago. Yeah. Will's like, it's like Will's going on camp. Yeah, but I also think Will should be touring. I think that's the one thing that when you're writing music, you need to understand, you know, and not for any other reason, but it's not easy. It's not being on tour is not easy. So now when he goes out and he tours, I'm like, sick, this is cool. Because then when I'm complaining about touring, he'll understand. understand. Like, I know they're having some backline issues right now and they have some things going on which is typical for tour, right? Like, that's just what happens. So those then when I complain about that, he can be empathetic and, like, understand. He's, right now, he is in a green room. He is in Hamburg logo green <laughs> room. <laughs> <laughs> that's where Will Woo! Putney is right now. Eating, like, raw tofu. Yeah, because there's th- four chairs. Yeah. <laughs> Three I mean, bands, four chairs. Four chairs. One of them is broken, and the other one's duct taped back yeah. together. But, I mean, I think End is a sick band. And I think End yeah, is like the other side of what Will Putney does. So with Fit, I mean, we could talk about the the lineage and how it worked. Like when we wrote our first record, it was like every other band. We were in a room together. And then when we wrote Hellbound, Will just had all of these ideas. And it was like, all right, I'm just going to be stubborn and complain about not writing. But Classic. Like, yeah, I'm a every, prick. Yeah, but yeah. everyone does it. Yeah, So, but then he's like, oh, I got all these tracks, you know, and it's like, Fuck, dude. Every like, single person that knows Will does a Will impression yeah. on this like, ready, ready? podcast. I've got all these tracks, you know. It's, he doesn't, it, and he, I, no more glasses now. He had the LASIK he surgery. but crazy. He, it's just so weird. I've known him forever with glasses. But, uh, you know, he's. it's like, how do you argue with perfect? How do you, you know, like, and I know people say, oh, you're saying Fitz. But no, I'm saying that when he writes these songs, I listen to them. I'm like, this is fucking yeah, perfect. He like has it. a fucking Grammy. If yeah, anyone has guy, a bone to pick, like, oh, you're saying Will's perfect. Yeah, he fucking yeah, is. he's fucking perfect. Like, and I'll I'll send him one or two riffs, and then I'll hear something that's similar. And I'm like, okay, like I did my job. Like, yeah. he, I inspired him to write a riff. Cool, that's great. Like, whatever. That's all I need. I come in, I write a couple solos. Boom, I'm done. It's over. I've contributed to things I need to. My job is to take Will's ideas and go out and pound them into the pavement. But that's every band. Every band has one, maybe two people. I mean, you look at bands like Meshuggah. The drummer writes 80% of everything. The singer barely writes the lyrics. It's in every interview. They talk about it. Mm. Like, music isn't just about writing as a unit. There's also the idea of one person having the ability to write music skills. that benefits the band. And, and whatever, I mean, I have other projects that I'm kind of like slowly working on in the background for me to get that thing that I need, but it's never as good as what Will yeah. shits out. So did you, know? you find how many years did it take you to just 
be okay with Two that. records. Two records. That, I think that's the same with everyone. Everyone I know that has two guitarists, it's only bands with two guitarists, because yeah. mo most of the time it is... It's a guitar player. Yeah. Well, we have... You have fucking three, three guitarists. So two live plus two Will. live players plus Will. Yeah. And the thing is, is Will writes music very differently than we do, right? Will plays differently than we do. So when we get the music, sometimes I have to find a way to play this riff that he's playing, locate the notes in a different area on the guitar neck, and then work it there so it works for me. Work so like there's this whole standing up. So yeah, you can do it standing up. There's this whole rewriting process that we have to do where we're kind of like figuring out what works for us in what way. And and it's fine. It's this whole it, we've got it now. And the thing is is like we've been talking a lot and now that we've been, you know, uh, somewhat groomed to play music the way that Will writes it, mm. now we can maybe successfully write some stuff to give to him. Yeah. So we've been talking about getting our own rehearsal room, not having to share with anybody, just a space that we can have so we can get in a couple times a month and actually be a band again. Yeah. You know? Like, there's a lot of things we want to do, but it, it won't stop Will from writing fucking 300 great songs while we're on tour. It's just, it is what it is. Yeah. You can't argue with a, a great, what do you do? Do you listen to it? And you're in your heart, you know it's perfect. And yeah, what am like, I gonna do? Oh fuck it, I want to write it. No, I, it's funny you you say that with the like. The more you've played what he's written, the more you can bring stuff to the table that you know he's gonna like. That fits yeah, in. even because Will is a massive part of Stray, huge part of Stray. Sure. He's credited as a writer on Stray records. Like there'll be times when me and Tom are writing something and I'm practicing it and I fucking hear like the ghost of Will Putney in my head and he's like, that's not gonna work. No, no. <laughs> and he'll go like, oh, I'm gonna need, um, and the main one is, uh, I'm gonna need a China on that snare. And I'm like, it's almost impossible. And he's like, you can do it. And yeah. then we do it and 10 takes later I get it. But then, so when I write parts now, it's always like I have yeah, the, the will, ghost, yeah, the, the ghost little tiny will putty on your shoulder. Tiny little will putty. Whispering in your ear. Play it better. Yeah. Do it one more time. Do, do this instead. You get, do it again. You got it. Next one, you got it. Next one, you got he it. He does this thing with me where I'm like, I can't do this. He probably does this with you. I'm like, I can't do this because I'll have to replicate this live. Mm -hmm. And then he'll go, let's just try it. And if you get it, you, we, you get it. And then, of course, I get it once. And he goes, oh, you got it. And then it's like, I have to go and practice that for 30 hours. That one yep. little fucking yeah. fill. My favorite line from Will Putney is, it's not my job to play it well right. What, play it well live. That's your job. It's my job to write the track. And that's a non-negotiable thing because Will puts so much time into the music. And we have to... And, I'm a mediocre guitar player at best. I have to work my fucking ass off to keep Me, up with Tim. Up. No, it's just the facts, dude. A guy like Tim makes me better. A guy like Blue makes me better. And in the past three years as a guitar player, I've improved leaps and bounds because the music has just gotten intense. And everybody says, oh, these sound easier. And, and like you listen to a song like um, uh, Two Towers, and that's this clean, open... You know that boo -da 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 big huge open. Is that the first single? Uh, no, the first single is Far From Heaven. That's another one. That bouncy riff in the beginning, mm. that's a son of a bitch to play because you have to be consistent. It's more the timing than the playing. Yeah. So you're like, you know, now we have in ears and I got the click in my ear and it makes it all easier. But for years we didn't have that. So it was like, you, you either get good enough to play it or you sound like shit every night. So that's just it. You know, like, we had to get good enough. So, you know, say what you will about Will Putney and about, like, what he does for Fit for an Autopsy. But I'll tell you right now, man, like, I love having him in the position that he's in. I love having Blue and Tim tell me, you played like shit tonight. Like, you have to work on this. And we do it to each other. We all do. Hypercritical. Because now when you see my band, 10 years ago, we would have never sounded like this. Mm. You know, each member in this band has, like... Hosean's a fucking monster. Like, each member has brought a different thing to the table that has changed the way we sound as a band. And being an original member, me and Will are the last original members of the band, and watching the evolution as the members come in, I realized something is that bands have to have member changes. It's a very rare thing that you don't, in the beginning stages of the band, and the beginning stages is like the first three or four records. Mm. And once you get that right team, 
it just happens. Yeah, you've you got know? this trial and error. Yep, and you're, you're not an original member of Stray, yeah? But you brought something to the team that wasn't there before, and everybody says it, like, that you completed that band. You know what I mean? Oh, I thanks, mean, mate. that's just true, you know, and you can hear it. So it's just the evolution that has to happen. It's not easy. I had, I mean, there was a point where Will was going to quit because we lost a member that was a good friend and he wanted to walk away. And I was like, absolutely not. Yeah. You cannot give up on yeah, this. Yeah, you absolutely I was can't. like, if you're not going to do it, I'm still going to do it. So you should just stay. And then the I'm going to destroy your empire. Yeah, I'm, I'm deliberately going to write gonna bad shit, songs. I'm going to shit all over your empire. It's going to sound like fucking hate breed or mad ball by the time we're done. So, so I'm still going to not that they're not great credit. bands. It's just going to not it's be so what it different, is. Yeah. Hate breed and mad ball are both great bands. Just a different thing, you know. Um, I don't want it to sound like I'm talking badly about those bands. I know not. you love those bands. Yeah, I do too. Set it off is probably like my favorite early New York hardcore record ever. That and. And there's a couple others, but that record fucking rules. Is um, is that what you came up on? Hardcore? Yeah. No, I mean, I grew up going to thrash metal shows. And then 86, 87, I discovered like Cro-Mags and Bad Brains. And I was already listening to like Black Flag and all that stuff. And that just kind of developed. And then in high school, I discovered like, like in the early 90s, I was listening to... Some agnostic front stuff, and then like bands like um, American Standard and The Mob and all that stuff. And then I discovered heavier hardcore bands like Judge and Bold, and I love the Gorilla Biscuits and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, I discovered Obituary, and that led me down a different path. So I'm like a hardcore kid, but listening to the heavy shit. So then when bands like Madball and Hatebreed and all those bands started hitting All Out War, like yeah. I mean, there's uh, dude, Hunter Demons is like probably the best metalcore band that's ever existed. And then that Re started... Real metalcore. Fuck, Real metalcore. Real. I mean... Not what it is now. Come on. I mean, and both singers, both Bruce and Pete, just fucking murdering it. And that dude, Rick Brile, that plays guitar in Hunter Demons, is a, a fucking... Everyone should know about that dude. He is such an amazing guitar player. And luckily, he's become a personal friend. And, like, I get to learn from him. It's almost offensive how good musically that band is. Their drummer's incredible, everything. Reach kills it, like, so I love that band. Um, and then I discovered Morbid Angel, and, the, and then the Deicide Amon demo dropped, and I was like, whoa, what the fuck is this? And it was this whole thing that just happened. So I've always fought between death metal and hardcore, but I also love, like, Steely Dan, and I like fucking listening to, like, John Mayer, and, like, I, I listen to everything, you know, 70s, 60s. Yeah, yeah it you're a classic. Matter. Just a classic musician. I'm, I'm a music guy. You're a music guy. Yeah, I love it. So, I mean, at what point, because I wanted to get onto the COVID thing as well, because I was going to ask you, but then we might as well just figure it out. Like, you had a, you have a business. You are, you own a tattoo shop. I do. You are a tattoo artist. I am. Um, how did COVID affect that? Fuck. Okay. Where was it? Where are you based now? Because you will get some people that want to come get tattooed by you. Sure. Um, um Okay. So, December 2019, <laughs> December 2019, I signed a check for a year's lease. Great timing. Went on tour. <laughs> came home. We started setting up for the build-out. The plan was when I came home, we we're going to start the build-out and get everything on the level. And then I was going to go on tour and do the U.S. Dyer's Art, Murder Tour and then come home. And then the shop would be ready to open, and we would open March, April. Yeah. Well, as you all know, <laughs> there was... the world said, fuck you. So I wrote a check and lost, you know, a pretty good chunk of money every month, my partner and I, um, because we couldn't build, we couldn't get permits, everything was shut down. We went from opening in March, April to opening in July, August. So six to seven months of just pissing money away. You know what's crazy with that, though? The tattoo studios here were closed for almost two years. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is we, we live in a state where they were a little easier. You know, not that I agree with it, yeah. like, wholly, but I was in a position where it was like, can we work this out in a way where we can kind of soft open tattoo our clients and be really safe about be it safe, have one yeah. or two people in the shop at a time covid test do the whole thing and we did that 
And it was just me and my business partner, and we had one person working for us, and then that person quickly left. And, uh, and then we were able to open. And then we had somebody, this guy Andrew, who turned out to be an amazing employee. He lost a job, and he was like, fuck, I don't have anywhere to work. And we were like, well, come work with us. And then all of a sudden, boom, then we hired Josh, and Josh brought his apprentice, who is also great. And we got this new guy, Spencer, and this dude, Oscar, came to work with us for a while before he opened his own shop. And then all of a sudden, it's running like clockwork. Like, everything's right. moving. You know, all the fucking gears are greased and, and moving. So, luckily, we got... So, it sucked, but it could have been worse. Well, we lost our asses, and we were at a loss for the first two years of the business. Yeah. Like, we were just so far in debt and unable to catch up. But we were able to keep the business moving, and now we're doing very well. Like, we're very lucky. We have a very supportive... Um, neighborhood that we're in because we're kind of like a neighborhood tattoo shop we're not like in the city we're on the outskirts of a neighborhood and man i Where can't see you are in smyrna just outside atlanta um the name of the shop is rose gold tattoo our instagram is rose gold get tattoo it, it atl in. um and um you can find us on ig rose gold tattoo atl just whatever and uh yeah so you also reloca relocated i moved atlanta. Yeah, but I moved ten, 10 years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? Oh, because I just I always see you in Jersey. Well, yeah, we're, because we're that's there. where the band is. Right. I so, didn't, oh. Yeah, I moved I, 10. In my head, it was in fucking my Jersey. My son just turned 12, and he was two going on three when we moved from New Jersey down there. It was Atlanta and Smyrna and the surrounding areas are a place, if you're a musician, you can sneak into an area and not pay as much to live. And you can have like a lifestyle like the Northeast because I live just like I lived in the Northeast, 25 minutes outside New York City. I live 25, 30 minutes outside Atlanta. I can make city wages and live in a more like rural kind of area um, and pay less. My son goes to a great school, like, and my mortgage on my house is so cheap. I right, can never live in Glasgow, Scotland. Right. Exactly the same. Yeah. You can be a touring guy or girl or whatever and afford to live and pay your bills and support your family. I mean, the most important thing is if I'm going to keep doing this, it can't affect my son's life. Mm. So if I lived in New Jersey, I would never be able to tour as much as I do and live on a touring yeah. guy's wage. But living in Atlanta, you know, at the time we bought our house, houses were under the $200,000 mark, under the $180,000 mark. We bought a really nice house in a good neighborhood for, you know, a very reasonable price. And I'm able to support my family in a way that I never could on a touring guy's wage. And now that I have the tattoo shop, it's even better. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm very lucky and I'm going to say thank you to my team because my team of guys at my tattoo shop are amazing with customers and they make great tattoos, but they're also very understanding to my lifestyle and they give me the ability to own a business and to go out so my business partner and my guys if you ever see this thank you because you make such a nice guy where, where does the bad rap come from i used to be in a, a big fucking jerk off dude <laughs> you know so, so you're a bit yeah you're a bit like a like a legend <laughs> give me give me the worst of you give me the worst i of don't want to get no I because was, everyone changes yeah, I was just angry, man. I had a really rough uh, upbringing. Uh, you know, uh, you know your typical sob story, childhood bullshit. I'm not going to sit here and cry for myself, mm -hmm. but it was hard. You know, extremely, um, extremely rough coming up. You know, uh, emotional abuse and some physical abuse and sexual abuse and abandoned by my father and m my mother doing the best she could but maybe not being the most stable person ever you know i'm not talking bad but she yeah, went yeah. through a lot while we were going through a lot and you know my stepfather coming in and trying to make that work and that being hard and you know being on the poorer end of life and not having a lot of stability and you know and then being a fucking fat kid and getting picked on on top of that and dealing with that it just made me angry i was pissed off at everything and i did everything i could to take my anger out on everybody I could because I thought if I was hurting, everybody should hurt. And I don't realize, I didn't realize that then, Yeah. but I realize it now. And looking back, I was, I was fucking, I don't like who I was, but I like who I'm becoming. Mm. You know, we live in a time now where it's really important to realize that we're all broken 
and to empathize with other people's brokenness like and try to repair each other yeah. and also tolerate other people's process like i think the biggest thing right now is look like feelings are important uh, it, for the first time probably in the history of america we're putting people's emotional side over their monetary or you know don't be a pussy we don't say that anymore it's like okay well what's making you break what's making some you people still say yeah it. some people say it and i say it jokingly to you my mean, friends but the the but like the overwhelming population people, especially people in our world especially used, people never in our used world. to be like open to yeah talking about stuff like that right now if you you i can talk about my abuse i can talk about all these things in a way where it's healthy yeah where i used to just get mad you know like how long did that take 35 years was there a turning point? my wife oh and my son um, that's awesome everyone i know with kids is so much less angry than me i have an uh, experience yesterday i'm not even going to name any names just a friend of mine who has kids mm -hmm. and i was just we were just shooting the shit about something and one of our other friends had done something on the instagram and i was like look at this motherfucker you know just like like what you do and he just turned around and he went, yeah, but do you think he's happy? And like, do you care? And I was like, oh, I feel terrible. <laughs> and it was like an immediate, and I was like, that's, that's dad brain. You, I think you can only get that once you've, I don't know. And it made me like check myself. And I was like, I love that guy. Why am I talking shit about him? Right. Well, I mean, it's easy to, pre okay. So most times, and I found this out about myself, when you have some kind of an issue with something that somebody does it's because it's something that you know you've done oh it was exactly that as well <laughs> and you feel like an asshole and you know that this is wrong it was exactly right. that so like look man i'm not perfect i struggle every day i used to say and do things that i never should have said and done and he would make excuses for it and now i just say i was wrong you know mm. and there are a lot of people out there that have done wrong things there are a lot of people out there that have taken advantage and and said things and done things because for shock value or whatever and i was mad at everyone dude it wasn't just one person or you know uh, it was everyone anybody who was doing better than me i was mad at them mm. anybody that wasn't struggling i was mad at them anybody that opposed me or tried to make me feel a certain way i just saw all the terrible things in my life and i fucking attacked it and it was a coping mechanism so i didn't have to sit down and think about how vulnerable i was because these fucking bad things happen to me. And a lot of people are like that. And I'm not going to sit here and make excuses for the bad shit I've done. And when people say, you know, you fucking were an asshole to me. The only thing I can say is, well, I could say I was sorry, but that doesn't change anything. So if it's any benefit or if it means anything, you're right. I was mm. bad to you. And I apologize. And I've had people come to me and tell me they were bad to me. And like, you know, I've always tried to reconcile with things in a way where it's like, you know, when you get mad at somebody for doing something shitty to you, it's like, well, how many times have I done something stupid or shitty to people? So it's like, yeah, you know, you're right. And, um, and as people, we have to have tolerance for other people's healing processes. You can't tell someone, well, you're 35 years old. You should be over that part of your mm. life right now. It's like, well, maybe I just haven't had a chance to find the thing that makes me look at myself in the mirror. And when I met my wife, so... So it's wife or mushrooms? Yeah, yeah, I mean, DMT, you know what I, I mean? I did the like, other one. <laughs> but uh, when I met my wife, I was in a really weird position. I had just gotten out of a really bad relationship with somebody who I cared about deeply, but I probably should have never been in a relationship with because both of us were broken as shit. Mm. But, you know, she's doing great, you know, and I'm doing great, and we still talk, and that's really cool and healthy, I think, to have a relationship with somebody that you should have never been with in the first place. So I met my wife at a point in my life where I wasn't looking to be with anybody. I was just pissed and didn't want anything. And she just pressured her way in there. And I don't say that lightly. Like she sought me out and put the time in and showed up at my old job after we had gone out on a date and didn't necessarily go the way we both wanted it to because I was distracted. And she was trying to look like you know, she wasn't looking for a relationship and there was all these weird underlying things. It was nice. We had a nice time, but I just took her home, kiss on the cheek and left kind of thing. 
And she just kept coming around and it made me feel like, wow, like, why is this girl pursuing me? And then, you know, she had a setup at home, man. She had a nice car and a college education paid for and her parents gave her everything she needed. And um, she literally gave all that up to move out of her parents' house and move in with me. They took the car away. They did all this stuff. And she's like, I don't care. She's like, I, I want to be with you. And like that made me sit back and be like, wow, like, holy shit, that's a fucking big deal. So then I started looking at myself differently. And then a couple of years later, she got pregnant with my son. And then it's like, all right, I really have to figure out what's going on in my life. Mm. I used to talk to people like shit. I used to just be pissed off all the time. And I don't want to be like that around my son. And then I just, she helped me. I, I'm not fixed. I'm just better along the line than I was before. She helped me do all that. I owe her. I always tell her, like, when you're ready to leave, I fucking get it. You know what I mean? You've been putting up with a lot for the past couple of years. But, like, we have the kind of relationship where we'll start really heated, but then we realize what's going on, and we can sit down and talk. And, like, that has transcended into other areas of my life. I still fight with people. Will, more than anyone, he's like, we go at each You know how he can get. Yeah. And we, boom, we clash, and then call each other back and then we can be level but i wasn't always like that i would just fly off I just... i'm so stubborn i'm the, the, that's my worst thing i'm so stubborn i could just i can easily like if i have an argument with someone i can put the phone down I'm and not never speak ever. to them ever again well, i didn't speak to my mother for like two and a half years because of something she said that she shouldn't have said you know i'm very much capable of doing that i hope we don't fall out or else we'll never speak again but me and you yeah nah We'll never. <laughs> nah, I don't think too so. adorable. And we don't work together. No, we don't. There's no need to work. Yeah. We're, it's, fine. it's easy when you don't have to do anything serious with somebody. If you could just be friends. Uh, I and, have I I have friends where I've I've went to work with them or we've done like one project together and we're yeah. like best friends and we're like by the end of it we've both been like, We can't do that again. Yeah. Because it's Well, I've been friends with my business partner for like fucking twenty years. And I actually have two business partners that are actually people that have really helped me um fix my brain and uh one of them i was having a really hard time through covid and we were opening the shop together and he got pissed at me and rightfully so and he came at me in a way where like i was like you, you know not doing enough and kind of he was doing more because i was i felt like i was failing at everything my fucking tattooing career was falling apart because of covid and my fucking music career was falling mm -hmm. apart and I had some money saved and it was just fucking flying out the door and I was panicking. How am I going to, well, how am I going to feed my kid? How am I? Yeah. And I was just depressed, like borderline, like fucking bullet in my brain depressed. And he came at me and he was pissed and he had every right to be pissed. But the second that I said, I'm not doing good, the conversation immediately mm. changed and he became my friend again. And I realized that I had good people. He helped me a lot too. That helped me a lot. And, you know, uh, you don't think you have that in your life until it shows its face. And I owe him and my wife and one of my other friends uh, who I'm in another band with. Like, I just owe all these people for helping me realize that I can be a decent human being. Because when you're in that state, you don't think you can. Yeah. You think you deserve all the shit. And you don't realize that your attitude is just creating the shit. No one's giving you the shit. The world is not forcing the shit to you. You're... You're um, creating your own pile of shit to jump in yeah. every day. And as you start to realize that and get better, it becomes a smaller pile. And then you're just stepping in it instead of like diving in it. Yeah. You know what I and mean? And when you're working with someone, when you're working with friends, I, I can relate to that as well during the pandemic. I have, fuck, when I was at my lowest during the pandemic, similar thing. Like I fucking, you know, when, you know, everyone fucking knows my shit. I went through a fucking divorce during the pandemic, loads of shit. And, uh, but similar shit, and I'm working with people who are friends, and I'm trying to work through it and figure out what we're doing or whatever. And there's one guy that I like. I don't even want to say his name or whatever, but like, I remember just texting him out of the blue, like, "Just fuck you, man." And it was like, and he, and then we had this huge argument, and then I, then I did exactly the same as you. I was like, "Look, I am fucking low. I'm, really, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm fucking like." And then again, it just changed, and we had a chat. Same Rob that does my merch, Robert Allotment does my merch. We have, you know, I'm, he's got a fucking balance in a million bands and I'm throwing ideas at him and all this shit and something gets lost in translation or whatever. 
and we have a fucking huge blow up about it. And then at the end of the day, it's like when like when when Lyca went into hospital, like he, we were we were arguing about something business wise, but then he just phones me and he's like, "Is she okay?" And we you know we had a big chat, and it was like immediately, you know, you forget the business thing, and then the chat, the friend chat, makes you realize like I'm kind of being a cunt. Yeah. And, well, I mean, the the biggest problem is, is you. You never know how many of your friends are ready to chew on the end of a gun. Always remember that, you know? Like, that's a thing that you never know. Like, when you're mad at someone, then you're going to say something. Chew on the end of a gun. Yeah. I've never heard you it never, that before. You never know who's ready yeah. to end it. You know what I mean? And like Fucking loads of us. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing that I'm talking about. Like, it's not fair for anyone to put a time limit on somebody's mental health. It's not fair for anyone to tell me you should be over the fact that you were sexually abused when you were fucking nine years old. Who the fuck do you think you are to talk to me like that? Mm. That's a hard lesson learned for me because I thought I was high and mighty. Oh, I'm fucking, look at me, I'm tough as fuck, blah, 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 blah. It took my son being in my arms for me to break down and realize if I don't get my life together, I'm gonna ruin this human. Mm. I learned every... That's fucking impressive. Because some I, people don't. It's it, inherited trauma. I know, my father. It, you can meet my... My father didn't. And if he's watching, fuck you. Because it'll be that be way watching? forever. Would he be watching? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Sick. Fuck you for me as well. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had disgusting, disgusting human beings out there that are terrible. You know, when I see somebody who was... Who I know did bad things growing up being great parent, I'm like, you are bettering the world by realizing what was wrong with you. And we're going, and this is another thing, like we're at a point in time in, in our, I guess, social standing in the entire world where we're being more open to different lifestyles and accepting people for who they are and not judging people for the things that they choose and allowing people to explore all these new spaces, right? The only way that that gets better, the only way we end sexism, racism, uh, fucking classism, all these different things, the only way we end that is by teaching our children how wrong it is. Because when we all die, they're the ones that are going to learn yeah. from our lessons. So if you're saying and doing things in your house in front of your children that are not better for them in the world, then you're just still a piece of shit. You have to... Sign yourself up to the fact that the way we were raised was not good. There are a lot of things that happened in my household that when I was a kid that will never happen in my household as an adult because I don't want my son to feel how I felt and I don't want my son to learn the things that I learned so he has to unlearn them to be a better person. There's a big unlearning process that has to happen for people like us who have been through those things that breaks us. Like, you don't get broken overnight, you know? It's like the whole thing, you don't learn hate. Mm. Uh, or, I'm sorry, you learn hate, you're not born with hate. You know, you don't, you take a bunch of kids and you put them in a fucking playpen, they just play together. They don't know any fucking different. You have to be taught to hate people. You have to be, well, it's a learned be behavior. Jealous that starts a yeah. fight and all that stuff. Yeah, like, that's learned behavior. So you have to teach your kids. Now, I'm not saying I'm the best parent in the world, but I'm definitely not going to be like my parents. Yeah. And I tell my son, I bought him a phone a few years ago so I could text him on tour to tell him I love him every day. Like I tell him that more in one day probably than I heard it my whole fucking life because I just wanted to know. You know what I mean? So we live in a time where it's our responsibility. And when I say our responsibility, I mean parents and teachers, people who can teach generations under us that we were fucking stupid. Mm. And... That's it, man. That's why I... Respect to you. I, Shout out to all the parents who've yeah. gone through trauma and they are stopping it so the trauma ends with them. Yeah. Because they're changing the world. Break the cycle. Break the cycle. Yeah. My what son... a fucking nice guy. I only met you, like... I met you in the nice arc. So um, I'm like... I was coming, into, fucking, I was coming into the nice arc. I was yeah. like, guy fucking rules. Yeah, it's funny because people are like, oh, Pat, you're... He's just fucking asshole. That was honestly, I think the first time I met you, I, I remember someone being like, oh, Pat's coming. And then, and then you turned up, I was like, this guy fucking rules. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also situational. Could have been different. I could have had something terrible happen to me on the way there and walked in and flipped the whole studio over and then walked out. I was a fucking... I got lucky. I'm a nerve, dude. I'm an open nerve. And you touch me the wrong way and I'm, 
I'm fucking in pain and then I'm angry. But now I'm, I'm better at that. I like it. I'm going to take some of that on board. I think I'm in my redemption. I, no, I don't. I have, I have late life trauma. I had a great childhood. But sure. like, I think I'm in my fix myself, redemption arc, be more forgiving sure. area of my life. Well, a lesson that I taught my son was that when you do something to somebody, they don't have to forgive you, right? You can say you're sorry. You can say, hey, you know, I know this was wrong and it's my bad and I'm just putting it out there. And they can respond and be like, you know what? That's great that you see that, but fuck you. And at that point, you have to accept that, you know? So when you go through this repair phase, a big thing that holds people up is that you try to fix these relationships and sometimes people are, you know, unresponsive or they're, they don't care. And I think you can't be mad at somebody for being mad at you for something that you did to them. And that's a big thing. Mm. You know, I've done and said, and, you know, I look back on my life and I don't know that I regret it because it was a situation that I was in and I didn't have any other way out and I'm not asking for sympathy, but and I wouldn't have my wife and my son if I didn't go through all those things. I wouldn't be in my band. Yeah. I wouldn't be around like-minded people. But it would have been cooler if I did this in my early 20s. You know, I probably would have had a different kind of life. But here I am. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you can't live like that, though. People, like, I, I got asked the other day, like, have you got any regrets? And I was like, I genuinely don't think I have any regrets. And everyone was like, like, getting married? And, then, and I was like, no, because I wouldn't have... If I didn't have to pay for that shit, pay for the divorce, go through all that shit, then I wouldn't have like hustled during the pandemic to get the money to pay for that shit when I didn't have any jobs. And then now like the podcast is smashing, the fucking merch is smashing. I'm like, mm-hmm. so I don't regret any of it. I literally regret, not, maybe I regret some stuff, but they're not, there's, they're not well, in my mind. There's a difference between regret and like lessons learned that you can take with you. You know, um, if there's anything that I regret, it's, no, I don't, I don't care. It's like maybe not spending enough time with my grandmother before she passed. Um, my sister passed away a few years ago and that was really hard. And I wish I had a little bit more conversations with her, but I emotionally couldn't. I lost my nephew and my sister within like seven days of each other. Fuck. There was an accident with my, um, my nephew and he passed away at six years old Jesus Christ! and then my sister died from cancer like it was like it was almost like she waited until everything was finished with gage to decide that it was was her son no 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 it was my brother's son right and um but i felt we always talk about it like she held on it just seemed like she held on just a little bit too long but it's almost like she knew that she had to give the family a little bit of time because of what was going on. Yeah. And I don't know if she even was like aware enough to know because she was pretty far out. But, um, you know, that was like a crazy year. So I regret maybe not getting to talk to her as much. I was on tour a lot and I was on the phone with her a lot. And I came home and I was like, look, we'll cancel this thing. And she was like, no, I want you to go, you know, being the supportive sister. So that was hard. So I regret that. Stuff like that. I don't know. I don't regret anything that happened to me. I, I, you can't change not, yeah, things that people do to you, you know? So you, you go through things and they are what they are, you know? But, you know, it, life's a journey, man. Life's, you're such a fucking uh, old wizard. I don't want to call you old. I'm old as shit. Right, but there's wizard, <laughs> there's wizard vibes. Um, and you can, only, you can only have a wizard vibe if you've been through that shit. So fucking respect for you. Let's yeah. lighten it up, though. Sure, let's go for it. So what we're going to do is the thing that I started doing. I don't know if you listened to Will's latest episode. I didn't. So the drum. This motherfucker. Sorry. Um, I've so I've been doing a dream festival at the end, right? Don't you dare say a word yet, right? Because it needs to be off the cuff. And what we're going to do, I'm going to give you some people's examples. So it's a complete dream festival, as in like you were asleep and you had a dream and this happened. So it can be as crazy as you want. So... Well, I'll run you through what happens, but to give you, like we'll do it bit by bit, but to give you Will's final one was, it was in Australia, outdoor festival, two main stages, Metallica headline, Nine Inch Nails co-headline. They flip-flop, 
song to song. So Trent has to stand there watching Metallica play. Metallica is playing And Justice For All with the bass turned up, but with the same anger snare. <laughs> in, in I fucking love this. The crowd is all dogs. This, Will's got pretty fucking crazy. The crowd is all dogs. Everyone's drinking Spindrift. That's the, that's the sponsor. Then after the show, everyone gets on a flight to Japan to go to Ichiran and have ramen. And that was, I think it was Ichiran. Oh, the flight to Japan to have authentic ramen. And I'm flying the plane. That was Will's. Yesterday I did Malevolence, okay? Malevolence's was in Bali, Malev headlining. It's in a beach resort. Beach, stage, swimming pool. Three areas of mosh after the swimming pool, so people can swim, get on the stage, and literally stage dive. dive. Stage, <laughs> literally <laughs> stage dive. <laughs> Three areas of mosh, just a crowd kill area, circle pit area, standard mosh area. Then strip club style seating I love it. around there with bottle service and a Michelin star chef. Then amphitheater sort of style at the back. And then after all of this, it's Malev, supported by Drake, supported by a full hologram set of the 1991 Pantera Moscow show. Jesus Christ. Fucking sick. Pretty good. And all of this is over by 5 p.m., where everyone gets on a massive super yacht, and there's uh, Sheffield garage music played till the wee hours. That was theirs. But we're going to start with yours. Pack from Knock Looses was in Prague. So, you know, it doesn't matter. It's so just, it's a pick a place. So, number one, we're picking, where is the venue? Is it a venue? Is it outdoors? What country is it? Okay. Um, I'm going to say Cancun, Mexico. Oh, so nice. Mm -hmm. I got you thinking with this beach resort. Out, outdoor, <laughs> outdoor stage. Nice. Um, I would say... The stage backs up to the water, so the water is behind the stage. So when you're looking at the bands and you look past, all you see is beautiful Cancun horizon. water. Ooh. And the back of the stage is open, so there can be yachts and boats and things outside. So we can walk to the other side and play for people partying on boats behind. Ours oh, is a 360 360 show. stage. Nice, I like it. So there we go the with dream that. Dream festival stuff. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, so Fit has to play, okay? Fit's but, gonna Fit's gonna direct support. Okay, so who's the headliner? <sighs> Steely Dan is gonna headline. Wow. Walter Becker's Ghost is gonna play guitar. That's fine. It's a has dream. to. We it's have a, to. It's have, a dream. Right before the set, we're gonna have uh, a seance, and we're gonna pull his ghost onto the stage and force him to play guitar for his band. Okay, okay I love this. And then Fit is direct support. Fit's direct support. What I need from you. Is also what we have is a smaller stage and we mm -hmm. need a headliner for the smaller stage so at this point you would give me a small band that maybe people haven't heard of that you're really into um great american ghost is going to headline on that this, stage uh, yeah, nice uh, but that's going to be uh the hawaiian stage cool. so cool. everybody is going to have to play in grass skirts nice. and and uh it's going to be like a party stage kind of thing it's going to have Something that uh, shoots beach balls into the crowd. Nice. But the beach balls hit the air and explode, and there's smaller beach balls in there. So it's hundreds of beach balls in the crowd. Balls. Yeah, it'll Love. be unbelievable. Love it. Mm -hmm. Great American Ghost is on there. What's everyone drinking? Um, I would say we have a Polar Seltzer sponsor. Nice. Mm -hmm. Any particular flavors standing um, out to you? I'm going to say... Um, the Yeti flavor is one what of my favorites. It's flavor? one of the, they do like these special flavors in the winter and the summer, but they did a flavor called Yeti and that one was incredible. And then we'll just do your standard, uh, cranberry lime because that's one of my go-to favorites. Oh, orange vanilla. Cause that's the goat. That is the, that is the goat. goat. Were so, you, were you in the studio that when we were recording internal atomics and we tried to drink fucking i can't yeah. remember what it was we tried to drink a hundred or hundred something. of them yeah it was pretty it crazy was fucking hot and there was yeah. the wall of it on top of the amps i do remember i i bowed out i think i did 12 and i started getting like a fucking <laughs> headache throwing up. Like, yeah this is not right okay um what else do i need oh and what's the what's the after party what happens afterwards what okay. time is the so, show on till here's the deal when fit hits the stage we go up on stage 
right about 15 minutes before sunset. Give so yourself the best 360 slot. 360 like slot. So the sun goes down, and then the stage is lit by pyro and black light. That's all the stage is lit with. Okay. So then we finish, and when we finish, the stage drops, and another stage comes up with Steely Dan on it. There's just it just it's rotates already, in and out. Already set up. So then when we get done, we load up, and then when the show is over, under the stage there is a passageway to a boat. And that boat will take us around the Yucatan to another section that is all set up with instruments, hundreds of instruments, all kinds of instruments. And everyone from the show gets to go up on this stage and we record a live record of cover songs of different bands that played on the festival right. with all of the fans of the music playing whatever instruments so, well, they How are you want. vetting these motherfuckers? How, like you can't just have Joe Schmo coming yeah, up and playing the thing, fucking drums. But the thing is, is we have the best sound guy. Who's so engineering this? It, we're gonna have. I would say we have. Uh, hmm, man, this is tough. No, you're gonna fucking tell me that. Like, Woody, Woody, Twan, and Cam that we have out with us right now, and uh, Luke Buckby. And that's that's our four engineers. So they get to pick which instruments are f falling in properly, and those are the ones that they'll mix in. Okay. So we can make this live record that everybody that's at the show can be a part of, that we can actually put out and have everybody sell be it. a part of the sell festival. It. Right. Sell it back to the f Sell it back to the fans. <laughs> fans. Um, <laughs> okay, and then what's catering? Because that's why I forgot to ask my left. Um so there is a restaurant in... Love it how everyone like everyone gets so into this that it's like... It's, a, it's like when you're planning your Christmas presents when you're a kid and it's like, I'm not getting any of these. So, yeah, yeah. I want <laughs> There's a place called Manny's. It's a steakhouse. And Marshy from Thy Art and I go there whenever we're... I believe it's in uh, Minnesota, I want to say. Where is it after the burial? For? Maybe it's... Is it there? Yeah, I think it is there. Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's where it is. So we have them cater for all of the carnivores. And then um, we get a four-star vegan restaurant owner to fly their chef out and cater the vegan and vegetarian side of things. Nice. Um, but everything has to be um, French-influenced American food. What, what does that mean? Um, steak, vegan, vegan versions of like chicken and steak and like oh is that like does that kind of french influence Fre yeah but with french influence like american food with a french influence Twist. So, is yeah, this something you you're creating now or no that this, this is an actual thing oh, it's okay. a real thing yeah french the french influence everything with cooking french cuisine is like tons and tons of different you know um i didn't know they had an influence on, f on regions. american yeah culture. oh they do yeah for sure I mean, French influences everything when it comes to food and fashion. I mean, that's the Mecca. Um, and it's served by um, models from the Ford Modeling Agency. And everyone has... Now we're fucking talking. And, and everyone has to wear leather pajamas when they're serving the, uh, the food. So, oh, we've got some kinks in not, there. Yeah, but it, it doesn't have to be fancy, sexy leather pajamas. It could be like a bunny white leather yeah. outfit, full length pants with bunny soda. I don't care what it is. Yeah. It just has it to just be has leather pajamas. Has to be and leather that is my, my homage to, um, uh, oh man, now I'm forgetting it. Uh, why, Cardi B. Because there's a line in one of Cardi B's songs that says, all my pajamas are leather. She's talking about her being a freak. Wait, so, is she is she coming to the festival? She can do whatever she wants. Yeah, she wants. Like, she has to be there. Hard to agree. You know, she's playing. Hard to agree. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. She's definitely she, playing. She's playing. Festival. Okay, so where yeah. is she on the lineup? Um, she is direct support to fit. Okay, so yeah. let's do the rundown. Okay, Pat's Dream Festival. <laughs> we are in Cancun, Mexico. We have Steely Dan is headlining. Yeah, they are main support. Fit for an autopsy. We are on a 360 degree stage on the waterfront. There are boats and people partying on boats. They can watch from that side. Uh, the sun's going down when fit plays. There's a normal stage. There's a normal people in the other bit, not on boats. 
Second stage, Great American Ghost. Headline. Hawaii stage. Yeah. There is beach ball, cluster beach balls that will fire into the audience and they will explode and create more beach balls. Yes. It's like a game of worms. Yes. Like, like a kind of that worms <laughs> vibe, but with beach balls. Yeah. Um, then once Fit has played at sunrise, the stage, sunset. at sunset, sunset, the stage flips from underneath. Steely Dan start playing immediately. Um, after that, a tunnel takes everyone to a boat mm -hmm. where there is a full... No, the boat goes around the, the Yucatan, around. party around the Yucatan, see all of it, until you go to another stage. Another stage with loads of equipment that we make a record with everyone that was at the show. There's four engineers that are vetting. So and Will no, has to mix and master. There's, no, <laughs> there's a nightmare festival. Yeah. Will is mixing and mastering and just going, ah. <laughs> Um, and oh yeah, sorry. And Cardi B, of Cardi course. B is oh, the, sorry, there's a restaurant. There is Manny's is catering yep. for the carnivores, and yep. we have a four star, four -star vegan, vegan chef coming. Chef come in. Um, and every server is from the Ford Modeling Agency and is wearing leather, leather pajamas. pajamas. And Cardi B is the guest of honor between oh she's direct support to fit for an autopsy absolutely and she's gonna stay i'm gonna add this she's gonna stay on stage for fit's first song god damn right feature. she is and she's gonna do a feature it absolutely. was a pleasure to have you on the downbeat i've had fun it I, got it got serious and then i don't i don't know that there'll be a more lighthearted version of the uh the festival, the festival thing. <laughs> i'm fucking i'm i'm willing to try and i love the juxtaposition yeah i think for what it's worth you are an incredibly wise, just nice dude. And I'm very pleasured to know you. Well, I love you, and I appreciate you having me. It's wonderful to be here. And I can't go to your show because I'm going to see go my out parents. With your mum. And me dad. And me dad. What a fucking pleasure. Thanks. Uh, check out Oh, What the Future Thank Holds. Yep. Uh, what, what tours you got? Um, right this now. This is me supposed to be doing my job. Yeah, we're supposed this to bit. do this. Thing. Supposed to have already done this. Um, we are out on our headliner in Europe for the next two and a half weeks. Um, we will be hitting mainland Europe from the UK. Um, this is going to come out after that, so hit me with the summer. Yeah. And then... Um, anything announced? I, we don't have anything announced, but we do have... Um, we are going to Australia, and then we do have a direct support tour that we're doing in September that I am so excited about, and I'll tell you about it after we get off of here. Um, we did have... Um, we were supposed to go to Japan, but it looks like that might get rescheduled, but we are searching for things right now. Um, so keep your ears open. We are working, but September, we will certainly be on tour in the States for sure. And, uh, we will be in Australia, I believe in July. Um, don't, before you fucking leak anything, let's just fucking, yeah, we'll, keep, we'll call it right there. Stay tuned. I'm about to find out what it is right now.